Good morning, everyone. Um, it's my great pleasure to welcome you to today's session of our distinguished lecture series. We are truly honored to have with us Professor Jack Chiu, Chair and Michelle Foundation Professor of Media Technology at the Wing Ki Lee School of Communication and Information, Nanyang Technological University in Singapore. Professor Chiu is a scholar I deeply respect for his significant contributions to the fields of media and communication with over 120 articles and chapters and numerous influential books in both English and Chinese. His scholarship has profoundly shaped our understanding of global media technologies, digital capitalism, and working class network societies. Among his many accolades, Professor Chiu is an elected fellow of the International Communication Association, ICA, and a recipient of the prestigious C. Edwin Baker Award for the Advancement of Scholarship on Media, Markets, and Democracy. Today, Professor Chiu will deliver a fascinating talk titled SoftBank Empire Building in Asian Digital Capitalism. This is an extraordinary opportunity to engage with one of the leading voices in our field. And I encourage all of you, especially our RPG students, I know today all four years of our, of our RPG students are here today, to reflect on the insights shared today and consider how they can inspire your own research endeavors. So without further ado, please give me in giving a warm, warm welcome to Professor Jack Chiu. Thank you. Well, thank you for the very kind introduction, uh, Celine, and also for the uh, invitation. And uh, it's, uh, I want to thank everyone for coming on such a rainy morning. It was not easy. Uh, but the, the road was blocked when I coming from uh, Mong Kok, so sorry for the delay. Right? Coming back to uh, Baptist uh, is almost like coming home. Uh, I was in this room before for multiple Enfield defense, I remember. So uh, it's uh, heartwarming to see so many of you here and also uh, joining online. And uh, this talk actually is uh, have been in the work for this this paper I'm going to share is uh, has been in the work for almost three years, but it's also a new paper because we just submitted to ICA. And so this is uh, my ICA paper. Hopefully they will accept it. <laughs> Otherwise, it will be a unique chance for you to read it. And it's a uh, a co authored paper with my collaborator, Professor Chris Chen of uh, Royal Holloway University. Uh, uh, you know, because it's a uh, co authored uh, work, so I have to thank my collaborator. However, uh, the errors and limitation okay, of the following talk are entirely mine. So I'd like to start with a question, okay? maybe, maybe two points of departure. The first question is, how should we do digital media research in Asia or in the East okay, in ways that differ from Western studies? Right? Maybe many of us can use traditional okay, qualitative, quantitative methods okay, or use uh, uh, you know, the latest computational digital methods okay, to tackle theories from the West in the context of the East. However, uh, here I'd like to propose that uh, one particular way to do something different, okay, because our context is different, okay, is to depart, uh, deliberately depart from typical Western studies. Okay? In this case, we're, we're talking about the Western digital media studies very much centered on the norms. Okay, set by the Silicon Valley uh, on the one hand. And of course, when uh, authors, uh, the, the book on the left is probably the definitive book about the Sil Silicon Valley. And on, the, uh, and on the right is a relatively new book uh, um, about uh, the four internets. There are three uh, major models of global internets in the plural in the West. But there is only one model in the East. That's the fourth internet, which is called the Beijing paternal internet which is a paternalistic uh, model, a top-down model. And, uh, uh, but here, um, I'd like to use this opportunity to suggest there's something much more interesting okay, beyond this uh, you know, duopoly between the Silicon Valley from the West and the Beijing paternal internet from the East that we, can, we will uh, go into. And uh, one cri crit criticism of this uh, traditional ways of seeing the internet globally and 
in Asia is that these two ways of seeing, you know, no matter the Silicon Valley or Beijing Paternal Internet, are at the macro level of analysis. So macro means they're at the global level, as if Silicon Valley is the world, okay, or at the national, as if Beijing, okay, China is the world, okay, or, or is the norm for, for East Asia. But with this study, we're going to be focusing on one corporation. So can, can we go to the next slide? Yeah. Uh, next, uh, yeah. Why, why is not come? Oh, no, no, no. It's, oh, oh, I, I'm got it confused. I should have, yeah, okay, yeah, so this. So the, um, so this one corporation is uh, SoftBank. You may have heard the term, okay, uh, you, if you have visited Japan before, you probably have seen this logo in many places, right? So this is uh, one corporation, one model at the meso level, okay, in between the macro and the micro, at the organizational, you know, uh, meso level. And this is a uniquely Japanese and Asian model of kiletsu, okay, if you want to have just one thing take away, is this Japanese term for this study, it's called kiletsu, it's a Japanese term that hopefully you will remember after this talk. And I will explain what kiletsu means in a few minutes. So uh, second point of departure is the origin of this study. Okay? I, I was a uh, 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 team leader for the Singapore uh, okay, uh, uh, researchers on fair work. This is to study how uh, food delivery and ride hailing platforms, how can they provide fair working conditions, fair wages, fair uh, contract to workers in, uh, in Singapore. And during the pandemic, we could not meet uh, in person. So there was actually a pan-Asian from Southeast Asia to uh, South Asia. We have uh, a dozen country represented. We meet every month. Right? So the, um, and then we, we, we were having discussions about how to compare the labor conditions you know, in these platforms. Uh, most, most of them are food delivery or ride hailing. And, uh, and then, um, in what way, you know, we need to understand the capital side. So that's the beginning. Or if we only look at the labor side, you know, we don't look at the capital side, then we are missing a lot of the more important things. So this study, you know, by going into looking at the, uh, the capital side, capital formation, capital utilization, and capital abuses, which you will see, it departs in two ways uh, from existing literature on platform studies or platform capitalism. You probably heard the term like from uh, Cernisex's uh, 2016 book. And most often when we look at these platforms, West or East, we are taking a very contemporary uh, 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 approach. Okay, As this is a symptom that I call presentism. We look only at the present. Okay? And uh, uh, these uh, frameworks are also tend to be very rigid with unit analysis being at the national level, we look at the Chinese vis-a-vis -vis the Korean, right? The Japanese vis-a-vis, -vis, okay, uh, the Singaporean. Right? So we, we look at one nation state at the time as if all the platforms within one nation are similar and across boundaries they're so different. Right? But this is, uh, this is a symptom we call methodological uh, you know, nationalism that we want to overcome. So as a result, to, to respond to these limitations, we hope that there's a, we, we should promote a historical materialist approach beyond the confinement of this uh, global local uh, binary. You know, here, by historical materialist, okay, we mean we must analyze institutional legacies and the past cultural formations in order to understand what is going on today, okay, including AI-powered digital economy. Our approach echoes in this way in the 2016 Cernisex book, if you uh, read about it, about ca uh, platform capitalism, in which he argues for a continuity between platform capitalism and industrial capitalism. You will see this in, the, uh, in today's economy. There is actually a continuity of industrial capitalism and uh, platform capitalism rather than a break. Although in uh, the East Asian context, okay, the continuity means something completely different from the continuities we see in the West. To fully understand okay, this uh, uh, uniqueness in Asia, uh, we need to uh, 
transcend national boundaries. So it's not uh, kiletsu is a Japanese word, but in order to fully understand the origins of kiletsu and of uh, SoftBank today, we need to go as far back to Manchuria, okay, Manzhou Guo. Okay, so this is today's northeast region of China, but that was actually the origin of kiletsu or Japanese, right? And uh, so before we zoom into uh, Japan and Northeast Asia, uh, Northeast China, let's take a step back to have a look at the glance over Asia at large. So these are, you know, th this is a very ugly, okay, and a very rough map about different kinds of food delivery platforms, okay, uh, throughout Asia, right? And uh, you can, I'm not going, going through any of them, just to give you a sense, if you look at it, very, very few of the dominant platforms, okay, in, in Asia are from the West. The Hong Kong is an exception where Deliveroo is a major player. In Singapore, Deliveroo had less than 3% of uh, market share, right? And uh, uh, Uber Eats is, uh, is only, uh, you know, present in uh, Taiwan, uh, Japan, but in most other parts of Asia, the platforms are indigenous. Okay? They are from uh, you know, Asia by owned by Asians, okay, managed by Asians, and they have, they have different uh, 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 dynamics. So, how do you make sense of this? I would call it a mosaic of mosaic uh, landscape Asian, uh, you know, platforms uh, relations. So, the basic theory that we use to make sense of this uh, platform is imperialism or media imperialism. There is a continuation between these two. The classic, uh, uh, the most classic theory of uh, uh, imperialism, of course, came from uh, Vladimir Lenin, right, in the early days of his work. Right, uh, and but later on, uh, colleagues like uh, Carola Perez, okay, actually extended Lenin's analysis. Lenin's analysis, number one, okay, uh, uh, capitalism evolved into a state of monopoly capital, and this monopoly is not any kind of industrial monopoly; it's financial monopoly. Okay. And in order for financial monopoly to be, uh, you know, uh, you know, um, gathering more accumulation of capital, the best way is to export to other countries. So you have to e expand. You have to become imperialist. Okay, to go beyond the nation state, and uh, with the help of the political, the military uh, machinery, you can export your capital in a monopolistic way. Right? So this basic argument was updated by. Carola Parrott, you know, when you talk about uh, in this process, high tech, okay, including digital technology was a way uh, that go alongside of uh, uh, financial capital to reinforce this imperialist project from the need. No, but at the same time, we know uh, since the 70s, right, uh, uh, Professor Deyatuzu probably was involved in some of these debates, you know, uh, in the 90s, in early, the, the revisiting, you know, the media imperialism, and uh, uh, you know, the, uh, a book summarized all these uh, debates. Actually, uh, Boy Barrett was saying, uh, media imperialism is not one theory, it's a field of many theories. Right? And uh, some of them are more akin to the traditional territorial uh, uh, empire building projects, but most of them are actually uh, transporter, you know, transnational. Right? And, um, in more recent years, uh, with the rise of digital and uh, social media and platforms, we have scholars like Christian Fuchs talk about how uh, digital labor is, uh, uh, you know, enforced at the global scale through a new imperialist uh, model, okay, centered on Silicon Valley. And then uh, Dai Yongjin has a book talk about platform capitalism, right, including in the Asian context. So it's not entirely new when we talk about uh, uh, new uh, examples such as SoftBank. Right? But how come SoftBank can be called an empire? And why we choose it? The existing literature and also popular accounts, there are many popular uh, uh, books right, uh, writing about the, the entrepreneur, right? and uh, uh, we, we can call him the monarch of the uh, SoftBank empire. His name is uh, Masayoshi Song, and uh, uh, but, but most of these are Masayoshi and something are, are just called Masa, okay, by the shorthand, right? And uh, he's the founder, the chairman, and CEO of SoftBank Group, and uh, uh, but most of the analysis are very personal, 
talking about how he claimed his uh, his uh, his grand 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 uh, uh, father was Sun Tzu. Okay, the the art of war. He he claims right. So he's a Korean who was born in in Japan, and uh, he tried to construct all these personal legends. Okay, or personal cult, if you can call it, right? surrounding him, a lot of mythical, okay? it's like Steve Jobs or Mark Zuckerberg or today, Elon Musk, each of these alpha males try to have their own, sometimes by themselves, some by, sometimes with their PR team, to construct a personal myth that cannot be, that can hardly be analyzed okay? or uh, deconstructed. But we are taking, as I uh, uh, you know, started with, uh, this is, we're taking a, a political, a critical political economy approach to seek more structural and political, uh, you know, uh, critical answers to these three questions. How does SoftBank represent a peculiar model? Okay, this is the Kiletsu model right, uh, of platform capitalism. And why is this SoftBank empire possible? And finally, what lessons can we learn about Asian digital capitalism from this case? SoftBank is uh, selected here because it has an outsized influence. You may not use any SoftBank product yourself, but if you use uh, Uber, if you use Alibaba, you know you are using SoftBank in an uh, indirect way because these are the type of companies okay, that have received uh, investments. Right? So uh, uh, this info, uh, uh, infographic you know, from 2001 shows that SoftBank at that point invested in 41 unicorns. Each unicorn is a private company before it goes public, has more than 1 billion right, uh, uh, market evaluation, right? and um, 1 billion USD. Right? And here you got 41 of them you know, divided in seven categories from healthcare to retail to fintech to real estate. So this is empire has to be diverse inside itself, not just one kingdom, right? So you can see many, many kingdoms in this empire. And the most important here is transport and logistics. I just mentioned Uber, but it's not just Uber, but also DD, but also Grab in Southeast Asia, delivery in um, India, South, South Asia. So these are the portfolio companies of uh, 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 SoftBank in transport and logistics. They control at, at the high point. They control 90 percent, okay, nine out of ten of the ride-hailing market worldwide. And uh, so, so this is one company, but through the portfolio companies, they control 90 percent, right, of the world's, uh, you know, app-based, uh, uh, you know, uh, Uber-like services. There is no other investment company in the world who has so many unicorns in their portfolio. This is an image from the Economist, right? And it highlights, you know, again, Massa as a uh, as a Godzilla, all right, <laughs> in the Japanese urban landscape, right? Uh, he was uh, uh, the second richest he, at one point. He was the, the number one richest man of Japan, but he at this point he was the second richest, and uh, he was portrayed as a business maverick or or Godzilla, if you like it, all right? that disrupt Silicon Valley venture capital through SoftBank and, and his portfolio companies, okay, including Alibaba in China, ARM, right, ARM in the UK, Yahoo, right, still matters a lot in Japan, not in other places, right, Slack, okay, this is a key tool for digital uh, uh, work around the world, and of course, WeWork, this was the most scandalous, if you watch the uh, uh, TV drama right, about the scandalous rise and fall of Adam Newman, right, the CEO of uh, we, WeWork. They, most of their funding, uh, uh, I think almost 80% came from, we, WeWork's funding came from SoftBank. So SoftBank's strategy to create this kingdoms and empire is what we call Global blitz scaling, right? Uh, here is uh, the the size of the SoftBank Vision Fund. Okay, that's uh, it worth 103 billion U.S. dollars when it started in 2017, and was what was the world's largest. The, the the second largest was 20 billion, right? So the 
uh, SoftBank Vision Fund One was five times bigger than the seconds, right? And uh, um, and so you can see how how it works. Okay, number one, it works through direct investments. But when SoftBank invests in a unicorn, it does not take up all. So we we work was the exception. We work is uh, um, SoftBank uh, uh, in, uh, control uh, uh, invested 80 percent, you know, of the all the capital in uh, WeWork. But SoftBank delivery kept, even though it invested 80 percent of the funds, its voting right is 49 percent. Okay, so it deliberately gives 51 percent to the original right uh, owner of WeWork. But in most other cases, SoftBank would only take up 20 to 40 percent. So not, uh, not the majority stake; it's the minority stake, right? And uh, uh, so that uh, you will use the, the original management team rather than the SoftBank have direct, uh, even if it's a direct investment, but it's indirect management uh, influence. And at the same time, they encourage you know the uh, platform companies to use a super aggressive right uh, way to to give a lot of okay discounts for example right or um, to buy out other companies as five or ten times the market evaluation this is what we call uh, super evaluative and the goal is for softbank to preordain the winner so this is we don't want so this is go back to monopoly capital we don't want a natural process of market competition we want to preordain we want pre-select we are the gods Okay, we select who will be the winner. Okay, in uh, one uh, in one market, right? And then the uh, they will when, once they select the winner, they will over invest. Okay, the, the story started in the 1990s when Yahoo was valued uh, at uh, um, uh, uh, two million dollars, and then Masayoshi Song went there to say, "I want to give you 20 million dollars." And Jerry Young, the Yahoo uh, founder, saying was like. It was scared. Why? Why you gave me ten times more? And uh, Master Yoshi San was saying, uh, uh, everyone needs uh, twenty million dollars. Okay. And uh, and then the next thing is uh, the competitor of uh, Yahoo at the time was called Excite, and he was he threatened uh, 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 Jerry Young. He said, if you don't take my twenty million dollars, I'm going to give you to Excite. And then they will destroy you. Okay. And then so so that's how you know uh, Yahoo got. Um, uh, uh, Twenty million dollars from Masayoshi Son. So this is called overinvestment, right? And um, and this is the uh, is based on the belief of uh, Masayoshi Son that once you scale, you become big, okay, like a Godzilla. Once you scale, you will get everything else right. The global barriers are coming down. So if you don't become global first, someone else will do it. So this was an expansion of a. Uh, you know, internet economy bubble. You know, you want to expand as quickly as possible, right? And the scale of uh, uh, SoftBank uh, Vision Fund, we just call it uh, SVF operation, breaks down the norm even among Silicon Valley venture capitalists. Okay, usually it's very rare. Silicon Valley will say, I, I I trust you. If you don't take my money, I'm going to give you to your enemy. Okay, they, Silicon Valley will not have this kind of uh, um, aggressiveness, right? And um, so this is uh, a key part of uh, SoftBank's business model and uh, strategy. And uh, what exactly you know is SoftBank? Here it will tell you. You know the there's an article already published. You know when when we started this, this is the only recent publication uh, by Van Dorn and uh, Badger right, from uh, uh, Netherlands and the UK, and they talk about SoftBank as a Meta platform. Okay. Uh, uh, this is a take that we respectfully, re respectfully disagree because we see SoftBank as a platform investor and a coalition of platform companies okay, from the east to the west, based on their investor-induced network affinity. So SoftBank want to be the investor and create this. Uh, they, they, later on, you will see it's called the cluster of number ones. We want the number one platform to come to all become our portfolio companies then they can help each other and become an empire right and uh, softbank itself you know, never made any decision using ai okay we know uh, platform companies are using ai for decision making but this is a case where okay uh, the reason for example 
uh, Master Yu Shang decided to invest in Alibaba. The same reason that he decided to invest in WeChat was that he looked into the eyes of Jack Ma and the eyes of uh, Adam Newman and said, oh, they have really sharp eyes. Okay, these are really smart guys. So I want to give them billions. Right? So that's, there was nothing AI data involved. Okay, it's very much his personal like. Right? And uh, he always invests in men. He never invests, he very seldom he invests, give this big money looking into the sharp eyes of women. Okay, so you can see his uh, own limitation. And, um, and one thing, again, we want to put it in, in the Japanese context. Japanese capitalism from the era of the Meiji, okay, the beginning of uh, Japanese modernization was under the, the uh, organizational format called Zaibatsu, okay. Fa. This is a family owned, so it's like a feudal, literally it's a feudal lord that owning a bank and through the bank they own many industries. The Zaibatsu was the, the, uh, uh, the economic heart for Japanese jingoism, okay, but at the end of World War II, uh, Zaibatsus were, uh, uh, you know, uh, eliminated after the U.S. occupation and restructuring of Japanese economy. And for about uh, two decades, Japanese economy does not know what exactly, do they want to become Western or do they want to build something similar to Zaibatsu? But then there was this new, the alternative model of the Kiletsu that came out. Okay. Kiletsu was initially, uh, as I will show, uh, built and experimented upon in Northeast China, in Manchu Kuo, right? And uh, But then uh, in uh, roughly two decades after the uh, Second World War, after Zaibatsu were wiped out, uh, the Japanese uh, government actually engineered a, a kiletsuization, that's how they call it. We want to make all the major companies into kiletsus. So it was, kiletsu was another natural emergence uh, from a Japanese business world, but something imposed upon by the Japanese government in the, in the post-war economic uh, miracle of Japan. And um, so SoftBank is, in this sense, very different uh, uh, from uh, from uh, Zaibatsu earlier, but it also continued with uh, uh, with a type of Japanese okay network culture again, mostly among men. Right? And uh, um, and uh, there was also we when we were doing this, this was Lindsay and uh, uh, Yonekura. These are two uh, management okay business school uh, scholars who in 2001 okay this was uh, more than 20 years ago they had an article talking about how a SoftBank should be seen as a kiletsu, right? But 20 years later, SoftBank is uh, a thousand times bigger, okay? But we still think, okay, this kiletsu argument uh, is actually making a lot of sense. Uh, before we go into the uh, specifics, let's first have a look at the organizational history. So this is a history of um, SoftBank. It started, all right, in, uh, the 1990s as a company that uh, print a magazine. Okay, so, uh, so they publish magazine about PCs. Right? And uh, at the same time, they import <coughs> software from the US to sell to, uh, to Japanese users. Right? These were uh, on floppy disk initially and later on, on CD-ROMs. So this was the business model in the 1990s. And, and when uh, 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 SoftBank uh, became publicly listed in the Japanese stock market. This was the time, the, the legendary moment when uh, uh, when they invested first in Yahoo, and and later uh, later in Alibaba. Right? So this was the early days uh, that, that uh, uh, both of them turns out to be very lucrative <coughs> later on. And then uh, one decade later in uh, uh, mid uh, two th 2000s, uh, SoftBank uh, acquired the exclusive right to sell iPhones in Japan. And this was the time it transformed itself from a magazine and software company into a telecom. So something like a, a smart home, okay, in Hong Kong, right? So they, and then only by subscribing to uh, um, uh, uh, SoftBank, the telecom company, can you buy an iPhone, right, in Japan. So this was uh, the second period. And the third period was when they started, uh, one, one decade later, further, uh, 2017, when they started to have uh, SoftBank Vision Funds, okay, the one 
103 billion uh, investment company, and uh, and this is the period we are focusing on. Okay, the current period. You can see initially it went up very quickly, but then it dropped down, right? And uh, uh, after the pandemic, but this was not the biggest drop. Okay, from this biggest drop, uh, uh, there was a, we're talking about a loss of um, this is Japanese yen, but this is a loss of about 50 billion dollars. All right, and uh, uh, but then early on in the late uh, uh, at the bubble, the 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 bubble burst of the internet dot com, right? Actually, uh, Masayoshi san was not only the richest man in Japan; he was the richest man in the whole world. He was richer than Bill Gates for two days, right? And then it dropped, and he lost uh, seventy billion. So he lost more money uh, twenty years ago than the recent uh, drop. And uh, and then after uh, he lost the the seventy billion dollars, he he was literally he was really broke. He, he almost died. He had cancer, right? But then he recovered. And uh, uh, so this is a guy who had already played uh, with uh, the life and death of financial capitalism, right? And the strategy here, again, this is um, using, you can see there's an Asian, you know, Buddhist, actually, a metaphor when they talk about the way we build our empire. He used this uh, strategy called the palm of the Buddha, okay? So we are the uh, we are the, the 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 Buddha. So no matter how far away you go, you cannot escape because I have these different you know portfolio companies in all the sectors. You know you are you are captured in. So you can see they are talking about we need to special we need to invest in you know so SoftBank Vision funds invest in AI companies platform companies. And then there are unicorns. If you are not unicorns, we'll make you a unicorn. If you are already a unicorn, we'll make you an even bigger unicorn. And then once you have the different cluster of number ones, right, so in different kind of sectors, you have synergy, right? All these different uh, Uber and, uh, um, um, uh, uh, um, you know, uh, ARM, for example, or Yahoo, okay, can work together. Right? So this is the basically all right, the, the, the idea, but using a Buddhist uh, metaphor to imagine, to articulate okay, their business uh, strategy. So this actually is, in a way, is very similar from Stenberg. I'm quoting from Stenberg. You know, he wrote the book uh, in 2019 called uh, 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 The Platform e Economy, how Japanese, okay, uh, 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 how, how Japan shaped the platform economy. In this book, he analyzed the the super apps right, in, in Asia. We see many people talk about why in Asia we have super apps in Southeast Asia and East, East Asia, but not so much in the West. It has a lot to do with this uh, background. And uh, uh, in this book, he, uh, Mark Stenberg, quoted from Japanese management literature and referred to this, you know, uh, uh, palm of the Buddha, you know, com consists of several components. Okay, first, no matter where you go, you cannot escape okay, from the platforms control or the indirect control of the empire that control all these platforms. And notably, you know, only a fraction, okay, of this book, if you have read it, okay, deal with SoftBank. There are actually many other contenders within the, within that period, right? And uh, uh, the, the first one is, of course, NTT.como, right? So the, that uh, owned, uh, the, the, was the largest uh, telecom, but also invest in this companies in a similar way and trying to build their the palm of the Buddha for themselves. And meaning this is a common strategy among Japanese platform companies at the turn of the century, okay, nearly two decades, more than two decades ago. Another point you note is that even though Masayoshi San's preaching may sound foreign to Silicon Valley gurus when they heard, oh, the, the Buddha, how exotic, right, from the Western, but this strategy was nothing new in the uh, Japanese and also Asian culture, including Chinese culture. We talk about the palm of the Buddha. You know, we heard that story of the monkey king, right? Trying to escape the, uh, when we were young. So there are lots of historical origins. And first, uh, the historical origin has to do with this book I already mentioned okay, by Mark Stenberg, uh, where he demonstrates the continuity between Toyotism. Remember in Western, you know, we talk about US 20th century capitalism, 
the, the most important model is Fordism, right? And then there's, a, with the rise of Japan, there's a post-Fordism. And the, we say the post-Fordism is best known as Toyotism. Okay, of course, Toyota is the number one car manufacturer in the world to this day as well, right? But then Toyotism from industrial Japanese uh, capitalism actually has a lot in common with the Japanese platform economy, as this book okay, uh, told us, right? And uh, for the Japanese, in this book, it's uh, it, uh, looking to the literature, platforms, okay, uh, in the, I, I forgot the Japanese term, okay, but there's a Japanese term for, for platform, it's the same, uh, you, were used as car platforms, okay? When you build a car, a, a, a Nissan or a Toyota, the, the, the hard parts at the bottom that can, you know, put the four wheels together, this was the standardized uh, chassis, okay, below the car, this is what's called a platform, okay? It's the same word when platform company in Japan talk about digital platform, it's the same word for automobile makers to talk about the car platform, okay? They are the basis for multiple different car models, right? So this is the basis. You can say the algorithm can be a basis for different kinds of uh, 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 AI uh, businesses, okay? As a website, this is sense, a website uh, app is equivalent to an automobile chassis, you know, in a conceptual way in the Japanese, you know, um, business literature. This was the years of the dot-com crash in the West. However, uh, this was also the year after the Asian financial crisis that impacted Hong Kong as well as many other uh, Asian economies from Korea to, uh, to um, Thailand. However, Japan was relatively less impacted. Okay, the Japan actually took the advantage of the global dot-com crash and also the regional Asian financial crisis to export uh, capital, by which they went on a shopping spree. Okay, they bought so many uh, uh, dot-coms uh, gaming companies from Canada to Europe, okay, to other parts of Asia, including Alibaba. So this was the, the moment. And, uh, um, uh, um, and during this period, uh, Japanese capitalist, you know, uh, uh, was also expanding, you know, with, through its mentorship program. It's not just giving you money, okay. Uh, Masayoshi san actually took the likes of uh, Jack Ma as his disciples. Okay, so they would go have a mentorship network. Actually, it was formalized. It's called uh, uh, SoftBank uh, Academy. Okay, where you go to there to study how Masayoshi Song, you know, does business, and then you learn his strategies. Right. So they were teaching startups around the world, especially in Asia, you know, how to succeed. Okay, how to create your content, how to manage, you know, your staff, you know, and also financial operations. And Stenberg, okay, saw this as a more benign system. He actually argued in this book, at this period, 20 years ago in Japan, the, the Japanese platform economy was uh, 10 years earlier than the Silicon Valley platform economy, right? And, uh, and at, at this point, the Japanese model was more benign, okay, to Silicon Valley, okay, that, by that we mean Google and Apple, right? Google and Apple just rip off the startups by charging, for example, 30% of all your revenues, right, through the transactions on their platforms. But here, uh, NTT Docomo and also uh, SoftBank at this period, they actually, you know, use mentorship to, um, to teach people, right? And also they take only 15%, okay, of the revenue of the, of their uh, uh, the transactions, right? And uh, while teaching them, okay, this, uh, what we just uh, talked about as the bleed scaling, in, to, to have to grow very quickly in a very uh, aggressive way in a very short period of time. And we can further broaden, if we dig a little deep, deeper from 20 years ago to roughly 50 or 60 years ago, okay, we can broaden our historical context to post-war Japan. Okay, this was the period the Japanese government, particularly MITI, okay, the Ministry of uh, uh, International Trade and uh, uh, Indus Industrialization, okay, they actually uh, had a uh, process to, to change Japanese companies into kiletsus, if you're not kiletsus. Right? Kiletsus are uh, um, a loosely organized right, uh, capitalist group, right? and uh, each of them own minor stakes in, uh, with each other, not major stakes. Zaibatsu is the, com the company owner, would have uh, more, you would own majority stake. So in this case, uh, 
Kinetu is uh, is uh, less controlling, okay, you know, you know uh, and, and more affiliation based. And this was also uh, what uh, uh, Chalmers Johnson, you know, the classic work about Japanese developmental state, how the government was playing an active role in growing the economy, right? And uh, but this um, this model also led to what uh, critical uh, scholars Bell and McNeil in 1999. Uh, in uh, uh, 1999, okay, they had this article to talk about Sonyism. Okay, so Sony was very much also grown by the uh, Japanese government. Okay, through not just the industrial policy but even education policy. Okay, to teach all Japanese kids that robots are cute. Okay, kawaii. All right, and uh, unlike the Western, all right, the, the robots are evil. All right, and um, so here you can see the. The institutional model, okay, uh, uh, supported by the uh, Japanese government, is uh, institutional formation that reacts, okay, in, in response to deep-seated crises. This is what uh, Bell and McNeil argued. Okay, it's not a proactive design, okay, uh, or even crossing the river by uh, dropping the stones. All right, this is actually because there are deep-seated crises. It, it's a crisis economy when Japan know they have a uh, limited natural resources, including okay petrol, right, and uh, so they have to find digital, okay, uh, growing digital economy, uh, such as semiconductor. Okay, at one point in the 90, uh, from the 1970s to the 1990s, uh, Japanese semiconductor was growing so quick that U.S. were seriously worried, right, and there were lots of uh, actually Donald Trump started his career by you know. Uh, a bashing Japanese semiconductor. Okay, that's what's how he, he has many complicated origins. But this was uh, the, the reason that the Japanese during that point of time, from the 70s to, to the 90s, was because they used a Kiletsu organizational model. And uh, Johnson also explicated that this root of the Kiletsu model was not purely economic. It was actually military. Actually, there was a whole chapter talking about the military uh, you know, uh, origins of the <coughs> developmental state of Kiletsu. And some of these uh, most important original experimentation with the Kiletsu model was in Manchu core, outside Japan proper. Right, so this is the Northeast. I don't know how many of you come from Dongbei, right? But in the 1930s, the Japanese empire colonized, okay, this region, okay, through the, the iron fist of the Guangdong army, okay, this, uh, the the, uh, the military, right? And uh, and one thing you have to know: the Guangdong Army in northeast China in Wanzhou, they hated Zaibatsu. Okay? Zaibatsu was dominating the island of Japan proper. proper. But the the Guangdong Army, the most people, they actually don't like. They hate it, right? The, the uh, proper. And uh, so they they started to experiment with this Kilesu model that become uh, uh, something that they can use to spur. Uh, oligopolistic, heavy, heavy industry growth that superseded competition, but meets the needs of the military. At this point in early 1930s, their main worry was the Soviet Union. They thought the Soviet Union would, you know, uh, come into Manchu and defeat them. And uh, so they were very much, uh, they, they want to build up quickly before the Soviet uh, invasion. And the key player, you know, for the first, <coughs> uh, uh, Kiletsu, his, uh, 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 the, the, the company is something, uh, you, you've heard the name, the, the term, the, the brand name is Nissan, yeah, the, the car company, uh, Nissan. And he was, it was owned, it was by the, uh, it, it was half of the Manchu Industrial Development Company, okay, Manyo, you will see uh, the, the Japanese term or Chinese term there, Manye, all right. And uh, the key person behind Ayukawa was the, CEO and founder of Nissan. He served as the boss for both Nissan and Manyo. And Manyo was the holding company. And he always talked about longer uh, scale of time, even, even though the Japanese only had Manchu Go for a little more than a decade. But he was talking about, you know, we need to plan for 300 years into the future when we develop uh, Manchu Go as part of the Japanese industrialization process. And uh, interestingly, when Masayoshi saw every year, when he meet his investors at the annual meeting, he was always talking about 300 years plan. Okay, and in Silicon Valley, so many people were like, oh, wow, the Japanese think such a long term, 300 years. But he would go back to 
the uh, Manyo, this was exactly the same rhetoric uh, they were they used. The go-to book to understand this period of Japanese imperialism is uh, by uh, Driscoll. Okay, this is a Duke University press book uh, published in 2010. And uh, uh, behind Manuel's success was because the, the financial, the economic planner of uh, uh, Manchukuo, uh, his name is uh, Nongkus, uh, uh, Kishi. Kishi, the, in Chinese we know him as Ai Xinjie. Uh, he was the most important economic planner who went to Nazi Germany to see how the Nazi Germany developed economy. And then he emulated them in uh, Manchukuo. And, uh, and uh, Kishi, by the way, is also the maternal grandfather of Shinzo Abe, okay, who passed away uh, not too long ago. And in this book, uh, it analyzes how uh, the Japanese empire used the three ways to dominate and to build their uh, uh, Japan, the, the Asian economic miracle. Right? The Manchukuo, actually, if you only look at economic growth figures, it was the fastest growing Asian economy in the 1930s. Right? And the number one is used bio uh, politics. So they were controlling migration, you know, using, you know, this was a colonial set, uh, uh, settler colonialism regime, and they disciplined the population, you know, uh, subject to uh, Japanese uh, empire. So this is a very Foucaultian analysis. The second part is called uh, neuro politics, especially women. Unlike uh, Western colonialism, Japanese colonialism in Korea and Northeast China was uh, the, the, the new immigrants into these areas, the colonizer, uh, half of them are women. They were much more, many of them are much more successful in business making because they learned their career or Chinese much faster and they're more flexible, all right? And, uh, and then they're economically more independent. So there was a whole witch hunting period when the, um, the Japanese, okay, um, under the leadership of Kishi, they put these more successful Japanese uh, colonial settler women entrepreneurs into mental uh, hospitals, okay, to discipline them, to manage, okay, their autonomy so that they can, they can leave more room for the male, okay, entrepreneurs to rise up, you know, for the, uh, the, the upward social mobility. And finally, necropolitics. Here are talking about the most, okay, extreme forms of colonialism racism and slavery, uh, especially for migrant workers coming from Shandong and uh, Hebei of China, right? And then they were used to literally like slaves and uh, once they uh, are too exhausted, okay, they, they, were, uh, um, uh, they, were, they were killed, they were uh, uh, buried, okay, to, uh, en masse, uh, uh, you know, uh, and, and also if they are not exhausted, uh, they, they can still be, have some, they were literally fed drugs. Okay, in order to produce more and, and then before they die. Right? So these are just a very quick look into uh, Japanese, uh, Japanese uh, the continuities of Japanese empire building. And, uh, but uh, finally, we, uh, uh, we look at the structures just very quickly. You can see where the, on the left hand side is where the money came from. SoftBank's money came from its own pocket. Okay, here we are looking at the uh, uh, SVF again, right? Uh, SoftBank put up 33 per, uh, billion of its own money, but the majority, more than uh, uh, 60 billion, came from the Middle East. You know, uh, Saudi Arabia, uh, uh, Mubadala investment is uh, uh, is uh, UAE. All right, so these are the uh, companies, especially Saudi Arabia. If you probably know the the uh, human rights, you know, uh, situation are so bad that. Uh, even Wall Street does not want Saudi Arabia money because you know they have dissident journalists and they are a dismember. Okay, you, you know the the, the, the terrible all right, uh, things they have done. But uh, uh, Masayoshi Son sat down with MBS, okay, the uh, the prince, the, the crown prince of Saudi Arabia, famously for 45 minutes, and probably the the, the uh, crown prince uh, looked at uh, Masayoshi Son's sharp eyes. I'm kidding, all right? And uh, and then in 45 minutes, he gave him 45 billion. So one million, one billion. Because these are again alpha male dealing with each other, all right? And uh, but so most of the money actually does not come from uh, in terms of original funding. And uh, SoftBank's 33 billion. Actually, most of these are Alibaba stocks. Okay, that's the most important. So you can see here what uh, SoftBank actually. So this is where 
the MAC capital goes out. So Alibaba is five, more than a, a quarter you know, of this is Alibaba. They are, and Yahoo is mostly Japan. All right, so you can see all these other, these are all the portfolio companies, these uh, UK company, right? So where are these companies, uh, you know, uh, specially distributed? In Asia. So you can see, actually, it's a Japanese company got all this money, but it only has actually one, uh, okay, this is blocked here. There, are only, there is only one company, it's a pharmaceutical, AI-based pharmaceutical company that's uh, SoftBank investing. But all the other companies, the majority are in China and India. Okay, uh, South Korea got four, Vietnam got one, all right? So it's very uneven. There's no investments in uh, Thailand, okay, or Cambodia, okay, or Pakistan, or, uh, okay, there's one, uh, Bangladesh, not other companies. So it's very selective on certain uh, companies. When they select you, they think you, will, you have the potential to become number one, to dominate the markets. So the critique, you probably already get some of this critique from my uh, introduction. Right? So it's a uh, very arbitrary based, okay, very much personal relation based investment. There's lack of physical discipline. They always encourage the, the, the portfolio company to spend as much money as quickly as possible. So no financial discipline, right? And uh, um, um, they really just want to have growth and faster growth. Right? And there's due there minimal due diligence. There are very few people who have, when this growth can really you know, generate the expected outcome, which is um, revenue or profit. Right? So that the classic case here uh, is, uh, uh, again, WeWork. Okay? The WeWork uh, uh, lost so much money. Right? And, uh, um, and also, the portfolio is not very diversified. So uh, when Alibaba stock was uh, Dropping after the end finance IPO, right? Uh, the um, SoftBank suffered because it was so much of its assets are concentrated in Alibaba. Right? Or uh, you probably know uh, DD's case when DD was uh, delisted in the U.S. Right? Uh, it's also a lot big uh, loss uh, to, for uh, SoftBank. So the uh, we are getting close to the end, right? So this. Uh, SoftBank model is most importantly a Kilesu model, where if you look at, uh, even going back to Nisa, okay, or Mayo in the 1930s, it tried to build a cluster of number one, okay, for automobile, for uh, petrochemical, for uh, uh, aerospace, they were building uh, fighter jets, okay, uh, you know, in um, uh, Northeast China as well. And uh, so their, their, their capital formation is really very unconventional, right, that, uh, Wall Street does not even want, right? And also the capital deformation is focusing on this high risk, winner take all, blitz scaling, okay, investments. You know, to form, the aim is to use the Japanese model, but project it at the global level, right? so that they can have such a kilesu for the global cluster of number ones. So to conclude, uh, today uh, we have uh, focused on SoftBank, is business model and investment uh, strategies, okay, is uh, pitfalls and also uh, promises as well as the historical origins. Again, according to uh, Vendum and Badger, the article from 2020, SoftBank is a me uh, meta platform par excellence, which is the reason why we chose this case. It marked the elevation of platform capitalism to a higher, more powerful level. Through uh, this study, we contend that SoftBank is more precisely an investor, an enabler, a network of platforms, and a project of digital empire building. It is not a platform or meta platform, for it does not wield algorithmic data power, and its decision making, centered on Masayoshi Son, follows a quintessential Kilesu trajectory that harkens back to the 1930s. Our argument suggests that instead of a single development, capitalist empire building through digital technologies has multiple configurations, some global, others regional, some embedded in the military industrial complex, some operating in the open markets of stock market exchange, others hidden from public view while relying on interpersonal ties 
with the global and regional power elites. More than a network bringing together AI-powered platform companies, more than a vehicle for tech startups to absorb investments and for capital to accumulate, SoftBank Empire is a catalyst that alters the molecules of digital capitalism and making it super aggressive, super sized, super fast, and super ephemeral. It is perhaps still too early to write the epitaph of SoftBank Empire. But rather than offering a conclusive judgment, our study here invites critical scholars to examine and historicize digital empire building beyond the West. Besides Japan, similar cases can also be found in other parts of Asia, such as Samsung and LG in Korea, ByteDance, Alibaba, Tencent. You know, uh, scholars have worked on Tencent, such as Taomin, all right? You know, these are from China, but also Southeast Asia. Similarly, we have uh, GoTo, Indonesia, Grab, okay, Singapore. That they, they, both of them have original footprints in most Southeast Asian companies. Okay, and these are just a few examples for future studies. Some of these uh, studies, you know, some of these platforms used to belong to SoftBank's cluster of number ones. Others are more independent. They don't have investment directly from SoftBank, yet they are also influenced directly or indirectly because of the mentorship, because of the cultural change you know, in, with, with uh, 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 super apps. So these are all deserving more analysis and they constitute a most dynamic frontier of digital capitalism in the Asian region with global ramifications. Thank you. Thank you so much for this so rich and enlightening talk. So now the, uh, the floor is open. May I first invite um, an audience here? Please feel free to ask any questions. Thank you, um, Jack, for a fantastic um, presentation. I wish I had um, attended this, this kind of session a year ago. Um, I say that for very personal reasons because I've just published a book on the geopolitics of global communication, where I have a chapter um, which I describe as digital imperialism versus digital empowerment. And I really do not talk much about Japan. I, I, I phrase it as sort of authoritarian versus democratic uh, digital imperialism. I talk about uh, US quite a lot. So I wish I had uh, read more on this. So thank you for enlightening me. But my question is more uh, I mean, what you were describing is fantastic from an economic perspective, even from a management perspective. And what makes it interesting is you have this historical context, which makes it so much more richer than a management article. But the politics is not in it. So if you think of what's happening in Washington today, Mr. Elon Musk has been given this enormous responsibility um, to shape the digital world. So how do you see that impacting on Asian digital capitalism, if you like, and Japan specifically, given the um, political affiliation that Japan has in the United States, and what impact would that have on the broader trends of digital capitalism in Asia? Given that the other major complex, uh, complexity in this is the anti China. Uh, rhetoric and possibly policies uh, which have strong digital implication, and then this idea of China plus one, where India becomes an important one. So it's a kind of complex question, but I think at the heart of it, that's the political part of it, not just the management. Thank you. Yeah, thank you, Daya. Uh, uh, this is a great question that will allow me to 
articulate a bit more of a subline okay, in this paper that I did not present uh, very well uh, in, uh, just now. Uh, I think the uh, political dimension uh, has to do with the old Leninist network, uh, that, that, uh, old Leninist theory about imperialism, in which he argued that uh, when uh, financial capital goes exports, okay, you want to export, it has it, it has to depend on the military and uh, national government sponsored. Okay, so he was talking about Russia, of course, right, and also vis-a-vis uh, -vis, uh, German, right, uh, and. Uh, uh, but here we can we we see actually the uh, political dimension that uh, we we use the political dimension of uh, uh, SoftBank's failure to build affiliation to get the Japanese government on board as a reason to explain its downfall. Okay, it's not it's not completely downfall, but it's half downfall. It, it failed very quickly because uh, it had very it has almost no Japanese government support. And so this is something that made uh, uh, this Kiletsu different from other Kiletsus. And when we talk about uh, NTT Docomo, you know, in, in Japan, or we talk about, uh, you know, uh, Alibaba these days is trying to, it's not calling a, a Kiletsu, but I, I think uh, Alibaba's uh, investment strategy, and I, I, in the last three years, Alibaba actually uh, invests more, okay, than uh, SoftBank itself. But the reason is because Alibaba have Beijing support. Right. So you can see the so we use the political dimension. So the when uh, 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 um, when Masayoshi Song got the support of the uh, uh, Saudi uh, you know prince, right, that in a way is he got the support from the government, okay, in Saudi Arabia, but he's not Saudi, okay, and the, the Saudi prince is not Japanese, okay, and uh, when he tried to, uh, uh, I, I we did not go into detail, but when he tried to do Vision Fund 2, so Vision Fund 1 was 103 million, he only got another 100 billion, right? And uh, he he went so far, he went, he just tried to find as many, so he was, he was completely uneducated, okay, when we talk about geopolitics. He tried to raise so much money from the, uh, from the Middle East, and uh, uh, he asked the Saudi, the Saudi was not giving him money, and he went to Qatar. Uh, by the way, I, was, I just came back from Qatar right, two days ago, and Qatar and Iran, okay, were, Saudi almost had a war, okay, had a, it was very, very bad, you know, binary, you know, so he even asked for uh, Qatar to invest in Vision Fund 2, which basically finished him, you know, in the eyes of the Saudis, okay, or the UAEs, right? So, the, so here it means he, the, the geopolitics, okay, what, what you are asking is a very sophisticated question. But for him, he does not care about geopolitics. He's not educated. He just wants money, right? But then that's actually part to to explain how he downfall so quickly. He had he had no uh, government support from Japan or any other country. So uh, I I don't think if we talk, uh, in the long term he will just le keep learning uh, other hard lessons from the geopolitics. Maybe from you in the future. <laughs> <laughs> from your your new book, I look forward to reading it. Thank you very much, Professor Chu. Uh, I would like to to know if Mala Chu Song just uh, likes money, right? So how about this uh, this we he used like uh, Kilasu 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 we to just give the money or earn the money or they can influence also the man company management or cultures like uh, miners because if a uh, soft bank is a kingdom so uh, empire in impact <laughs> okay. like UK controlled uh, Hong Kong in that days so they also share their policies about uh, to influence the society so if uh, Malajuchi song just likes money but uh, this week he used whether or not they can influence such aspects to the other companies. Yeah, so my uh, last slide, uh, as you noted, the, the title was Varieties of Imperialism. Right? So the way actually, uh, there's uh, hundreds of books about pre-digital empires. Right? So the way that the British Empire controlled Hong Kong, okay, 
starting well, you know, at the very beginning was the East Indian Company, right? but later on it was direct uh, government control. Not East Indian Company was abandoned. Uh, was abandoned. So within the UK, there are different models, right? and also the uh, British East Indian Company and the Dutch early on. There's a the the Dutch East Indian Company was much more. Is uh, you know the, these are uh, these are uh, imperialist companies, right? They are actually much more tightly controlled. So there are different forms. The uh, 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 you know, there's a there's a book called Monopoly and Trade. So you can comparing the British and the Dutch uh, East Indian Company. They're actually very different. The British are much more loosely controlled. In this, if you use the Japanese term, the British East Indian Company, you know, maybe it's like a 20% like uh, Shiletsu, okay? But uh, but uh, the the Dutch one was zero percent, right? So the uh, 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 once, uh, so so if you want to talk about the business model, okay, is that they give you they, they give you roughly thirty percent, okay, uh, uh, for your market evaluation, and then they teach you to be super aggressive, but that that's not how they make money. They make money is one because you are unicorn. Unicorn is before uh, before uh, uh, public listing, right? So let, let's say a unicorn is one billion. So I give you three hundred thirty million. And I got one third of your price, okay. But then once you go public, you know, I got one third of your, you know, so your your you you become from one one million to one billion to ten billion after the public listing. I got uh, uh, three point three billion out of it. Right? So my investment become ten times bigger. So that's how it cash out, all right. And uh, and then in the process they teach you to be very aggressive, right? To over invest, you know, don't be stingy. Right, so that's how you know they got their money back, or they can keep, uh, you know, I, I can sell half of the stake, you know, but then I, I keep the other stake in the future because I see I see your market will your market capital, you know, will increase in the in the stock market. All right, but then once you once once you are in there and uh, you have other, imagine, okay, I am Master Yoshi Song. Each one of you is one of my portfolio company. You come together to Tokyo. Right, I entertain you, and uh, you feel you, there's a culturally. So that's what I mean by he's quote unquote a monarch, right? You, you are you're all my little brothers, probably very few little sister, all right? And then I have the cultural capital to influence you, right? Why at the same time I also control one third of your money. Make sense? Yeah. <laughs> Thank you. So any questions from the audience? <clears throat> and also the online audience. So a really very enlightening talk, and I, I really learned a lot from this case. So my question, the first question I noted down is a very interesting description of SoftBank's approach to AI power platform. So um, Jack, do you see any parallels with other Asian tech conglomerates like Tencent or Alibaba? So it's my first question. And second question I noted on this with AI powered platform economies uh, becoming increasingly dominant, how does SoftBank's empire reflect or contradict in a way the broader debates around digital sovereignty and technological independence in Asia? I think you are one of the most authoritative figures to give an answer on this. Thank you, Celine. These are uh, both are excellent questions. First, indeed, you know now uh, SoftBank's uh, you know uh, money bag have shrunk okay, a lot, but uh, uh, both Tencent, Alibaba, and also GIC. Okay, GIC is the one of the two major sovereign banks in Singapore. Okay, now they are. I think uh, 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 Alibaba in the last three years uh, was the number one using this kind of strategy, and the GIC was number two, and followed by Tencent. Okay, so the uh, but so there, even even though GIC does not receive uh, investment, you know, I'm not sure GIC got people trained in SoftBank Academy. But then, without you know, because Singaporeans are looking at you know, so these are fund managers, sovereign fund managers. They look at what other companies are doing, so they see they are they are using a similar model. You know, I would say what uh, the Alibaba and. Uh, 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 
uh, GIC are doing are literally trying to create their own, uh, you know, uh, uh, cluster of number ones. So, so, in, so the answer to your first question is yes. And number two, uh, this is where uh, when we talk about AI, okay, it seems the, the the majority, okay, of the media accounts, okay, are basically saying, oh, we cannot control AI. AI are like a self like automated, and even the engineers do not know right, uh, how machine learning works because it's not supervised, right? And the machines are the the, the algorithms for fintech are changing every second. Right? How can you follow up? But this is a good case to let us know that at the end of the day, it's the owner, it's the CEO or the investor. Okay, they control what the dependent variable is. Okay, no matter when you talk about machine learning at the end, I want to increase okay, uh, 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 user engagement, or I want to, user engagement is the DV, or I want to increase fairness, okay, in the, you know, no, no, no children is unfairly, okay, abused in my social media platform, or I want to increase profits, okay, in Taobao, okay, that's, those are dependent variable. So the dependent variables are selected by human, right, and, uh, and the humans are, you know, especially this type of, we call them alpha male, right? These are super aggressive, you know, figures like uh, Masayoshi saw. They just want you to spend as much as money as well. Their number one uh, DV is market share. And we want, AI, no matter how, how you use the AI, at the end of the day, I want you to grow from 60% to 90%, and preferably 100%. So that's their DV. Right? And, uh, and the second is, uh, once you grow so big, I want you to go public in the, uh, in the stock uh, market, and then I can cash out as much as possible. Okay? So that's the second DV. So this is a case to show how AI are, you know, at the end, they serve certain human, you know, or meso level, for the, not just for Masayoshi san but for his, you know, uh, investors, you know, his um, uh, SoftBank holding company as a whole, but this is a, this is a private interest. Okay, so it, at the end of the day, is to, is to serve the private interest of the uh, you know uh, uh, you know SoftBank you know uh, uh, group. So so these are the uh, uh, places where we need to when you talk about digital sovereignty. Right? Sovereignty is an idea of public interest. Right? We 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 talk about nation state sovereignty. We talk about indigenous communal uh, sovereignty. We talk about you know, uh, sovereignty is oftentimes it's, it's not just a pr private interest. Right? Sovereignty has to be you know uh, people, a public coming together to share. You know, no matter you uh, you are rich or poor. So I think that that's where the uh, 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 the, the Kilesu model and the private interest oriented model of uh, Asian digital capitalism runs against digital uh, uh, sovereignty. So this is why, you know, when we talk about geopolitics, China, not, China was not allowed. Okay, India, Singapore, US, EU, they're all, all the uh, public interest representatives, right, in their governments, in, uh, diverse as they are, one thing in common is they are exerting their digital sovereignty. And then the likes, sovereignty is not just in Asia, right, but other, you know, the uh, Google and Facebook, they all face Okay, uh, they, 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 their profit margin are both decreasing because they are chasing pri private interests. But we need, uh, uh, for digital uh, sovereignty, we need to put public interest as the dependent variable rather than private interest. Okay. Yeah. Uh, so we have a question from one of our PhD students, Arjun. So I'm going to read from here. He says, thank you, Professor Chu, for a very enlightening talk. While listening to your presentation, two names kept coming to my mind, Elon Musk and Jack Ma. While one of them gets promoted in the US, the other gets tamed in China. I'm wondering how culture and government structures influence digital imperialism in this new international order. All right, uh, thank you, Arjun. Okay, okay. Uh, this study is trying to get away from personality analysis. Okay, but your question forced me to go back. Okay, and uh, but I still want to put uh, Jack Ma and uh, Elon Musk in the institutional process. Elon Musk was not promoted. Okay, in the U.S. until a week ago. 
Okay. <laughs> and uh, so the uh, and my prediction is within a year. Okay, I can bet ten Hong Kong dollars. Right? Elon Musk will be fired. Okay, by by uh, uh, Donald Trump. He will not last for more than a year because he's an alpha male. All right, and uh, 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 Donald Trump is an alpha male. Right, uh, they want to be number one. No, none of neither of them want to be number two. All right, so that's that's my prediction. And Jack Ma, all right, uh, for a time, Jack Ma was also promoted. Okay, was like the god of entrepreneurs. Right, but uh, now they, uh, you know, Jack Ma is much more silent. Okay, and sidelined. Right? And uh, again, because he now accepts his uh, position as number two. Okay, or at least not as number one. We know who number one is, right, in China. And so, uh, so in that case, all right, the, uh, um, probably this is a lesson going back to the earlier when we talk about the, the Leninist analysis of uh, about why software fail, at least uh, to a to a certain degree, is that the the, um, the digital capitalists have to find their political, uh, you know, number one. In order for them to find their economic number one, and so that's they have to be dependent on a polity, on a political, uh, you know, national political uh, leadership, rather than become a competitor. Right? And Elon Musk is uh, at risk because he probably is not as uh, obedient as uh, Jack Ma. Questions? If no more questions, shall we um, please let's give a big hand again to our distinguished So, if you have any questions, perhaps you, you can stay for a while if you would like to come to answer. So, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Celine. Yeah, so maybe we'll do this after the talk. Uh, uh, may I? For the sake of the photographers, okay. Uh, okay, okay, we'll do it now. Okay, okay. all right. Thank, thank, you. You. thank you. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.